So yeah, so I'm I'm Tyler, uh, and I make a lot of videos about chemistry. Uh, a bunch of them are on YouTube. I, I also made a whole series for the interactive general chemistry book, which was super cool. Uh, so a lot of folks have been reaching out to me in the past couple of weeks, wanting to know about some of my best practices for making videos. You know, this whole sort of pandemic thing has made everybody want to start making videos for their uh, classes that they're now teaching online. So. I wanted to share a couple, you know, we, we might call them sort of tips and tricks. Um, some of these are philosophical, sort of big picture ideas. Others are, are very targeted specifics, but it's sort of like a tiny little toolbox that I, I wanted to give you right away. And, and hopefully all of these are like actionable tonight or tomorrow. And they'll, you know, they'll really help. So first is like the biggest picture idea. And I think it's the most important. Um, when you start making video content for the first time, whether it's turning on a camera, talking to the camera, whether it's just making a, a, a PowerPoint that you're narrating over, it's not going to be perfect. And respectfully, you just need to get over it. It takes a really long time to build up to the point where you're making stuff that looks beautiful and polished and professional. And anything that you make is going to be helpful for students. To really hammer this point home, I wanted to put stills from two of my videos up here. The one on the left uh, is one of the first videos I ever made for YouTube. And like, you know, critically speaking, it looks terrible, right? Like my hair is in the way, the lighting is bad. It's very low resolution. I made this over 10 years ago. And then on the right is a video that I made on galvanic cells. I spent weeks cutting out all these little pieces of colored paper and it took forever. Uh, uh, the one on the left, which looks significantly jankier, has like 10 times as many views and comments and likes as the Galvanic Cell video. So it just goes to show uh, that even though the production value is quite low, it was one of the first ones that I made, I didn't really have the hang of making videos yet, it has helped like millions of students. And so any content that you make, even if it doesn't look like the most beautiful polished stuff out there, it's going to be helpful for your students. Okay, so going on to the next point, uh, this kind of dovetails with the previous one. This is really important to keep in mind if you're making educational video for the first time. I'd like to say that good teaching is not what we call good television. By good television, I'm talking about the beautifully shot narrative stuff that we see on TV, we see it in the movies, but we also increasingly see it on YouTube. Like a lot of the stuff that we just watch for entertainment on YouTube is tremendously highly produced. But effective teaching content, I'm convinced, doesn't look anything like that. Here I have two videos. One is a still from one of my uh, video on one of my channels. And another is from the YouTube legend, Patrick JMT, who's taught essentially a whole, excuse me, taught essentially a whole generation of students' math. Students love when they're learning slow, deliberate, patient, step-by-step -step explanations. In many cases, if it feels too slow, you're on the right track. When you're teaching a student how to rearrange an equation or how to plug in variables, you don't want the frantic, highly produced style of a YouTube edutainment channel. You don't want to be comparing yourself to something you'd see on TV. What you really want to do is be trying to recreate that patient step-by-step -step interaction with a student that you'd be having in office hours, okay? The result is going to look totally different than polished education. I mean, it's going to look completely different than polished entertainment video, but it's going to be tremendously useful for your students. So remember that good teaching is, is by no means good television. These are totally different beasts. So, 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 so don't let that hold you back trying to make your stuff look polished and flashy. It shouldn't be, and I'm convinced it will teach students better if it's not. Okay, next point. This is a little bit more technical, but super important. Good audio is so, 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 so much more important than good video, okay? No matter whether you're making uh, a narrated PowerPoint or if you're talking into a camera, people won't watch beautiful video if it has bad, echoey, crackling audio. They're just gonna turn it off. But if the audio is good, people will watch the jankiest video you can imagine. And so I always say, whenever you're making anything involving video, don't use the, don't use the uh, microphone on your camera. 
Don't use the built-in microphone on your computer if you can at all help it use some sort of microphone. And that's like, I, I'm wearing these like, you know, fitness headphones right here that have a built-in microphone. Uh, the smartphone headphones you probably use to take calls, they've got a built-in microphone too. You plug those into your phone or computer and the sound you get from those will be 10 times better than using the built-in microphone. So that's like a tip that you can start immediately and your students will be tremendously thankful of getting clear audio. Okay, the next point is also uh, sort of technical. A lot of good teachers, oh, I think a lot of young teachers in general, but you know, a, a lot of people who really thrive on teaching love the energy and the interaction of a classroom full of students. They love the back and forth. And a lot of them sort of go into the classroom with a rough idea of what they're gonna say, but a largely unscripted lecture. You know, they just sort of start going, students raise their hands, they ask questions, they feed on the back and forth. I hear from so many professors, you know, when they turn on the camera to make a video, when they turn on uh, the record function of explain everything or whatever, they find themselves suddenly freezing up. They don't know what to say. And a lot of that is because they miss that back and forth. They miss that energy of the classroom and, and they find themselves tongue tied. This is super common because teaching into a camera is extraordinarily different than teaching a classroom full of students. So I always say, even if you don't do this in your lecture, even if you don't routinely do this when you're interacting with students, make an outline, know roughly what you're gonna say. This shouldn't be a script, you know, cause then you'll sound sort of artificial like you're reading, but it's a great practice to do more organization of your thoughts than you normally would for an in-person lecture. And part of that is because if you forget something, you know, you're not gonna have a student, you know, raising their hand and saying, oh, wait, wait, what about this? So you kind of have to do the work of thinking about all the things you want to mention and making sure that you hit those points. And that's where a rough outline is going to let you relax a little bit. It's going to let you feel more natural because you know what's coming next and you're not going to be freaking out about like, oh, wait, what did I? OK, wait, do I talk about this before that or no? That's what the outline is for. It'll make you be more natural and, and just more, uh, you know, sort of more and more, more step by step. OK, next thing. This is something that uh, is really near and dear to my heart because if you've seen my videos, I, I like using colored paper and pieces of paper I'm moving around. And I don't use a lot of narrated PowerPoints. You know, I, I, like, I like magic markers and pens. And you know, I, I have a big believer that low tech is often better than high tech. And when people start making videos for the first time, one of the things they gotta do is, they think they gotta do is they gotta make everything high tech. So if they're using PowerPoint, they think they've gotta use the PowerPoint drawing tools for everything or everything needs to be drawn on the tablet or on the screen, it takes forever to do. Just take out pen and paper, draw it, snap a picture of it from your smartphone and import it into the PowerPoint, right? Done. If you like using the chalkboard, write out the equation on the chalkboard, do that. So here's two pictures. I, I got a mitochondria that I'm drawing. On the right, I'm trying to do it with the drawing tools in PowerPoint. It's a disaster, it takes forever. On the left, it probably took me 30 seconds just with pen and paper, just snap, a, uh, just snap a picture of it. In the next slide, same thing goes with equations. Something about like people start using equations in PowerPoints and videos, they feel they need to be laying them out in Microsoft Equation Editor, you know, or using hours and hours to typeset it. Now, just write it out and snap a picture. If you like using the chalkboard, write the equations out on, on the chalkboard, snap a picture of your chalkboard. It shouldn't take, you know, three hours to put a, uh, five set, you know, step-by-step -step rearrangement of an equation into your PowerPoint. It should take you about 30 seconds to write it out and snap a picture. Uh, the, the next slide here just sort of like reinforces that fact. Uh, Patrick's YouTube channel, probably the most popular educational channel on YouTube. All he does is just aim a camera at a piece of paper as he works through uh, integrals and differentiation and, and, and you name it. And students love it. They find it tremendously useful. Low tech is often and usually, I think, more effective than high tech. Okay, last two points, which are sort of broader, more philosophical. It can be really hard to feel that you've got to make everything for your class. So I often say, don't reinvent the wheel. You don't have to make a video on everything. There are a lot of good existing resources out there. So look, I'd be remiss not to mention uh, the excellent product, Interactive General Chemistry, um, that I uh, uh, produced the videos for. I made a bunch of them myself, uh, and also a number of my colleagues were the video presenters in, in certain topics. Um, we have a full range of videos in IGC that sort of like 
do all the sort of classic types of problems you'd solve in a, in a gen chem class. And if, if you want to check out IGC, maybe just for the videos, talk to Maureen, uh, she'll get you set up and you can test it out. You can have some videos to share with your students. Uh, and on the next page, I want to just do a shout out to all the other great resources that are there on YouTube. Uh, professors will often say, you know, like, oh, there's so much out there. I just don't have so much time to go through and find everything. Well, here's an idea for kind of a different type of flipped classroom. You know, students spend so much time these days learning on YouTube. Uh, when they have something they need to learn, they go right to YouTube. Uh, and a lot of them are learning, sort of doing their own tutorials from these videos in their spare time. And so maybe as a professor, you'd feel comfortable thinking about sort of flipping it a little bit and saying, you know, I want you to go out and find some good videos on X topic, or you know, you, you start teaching X topic on Tuesday, and okay, by the time we follow up on it on Thursday, suggest some YouTube videos that have been helpful for you. I guarantee you'll be really impressed by the thoughtfulness and the carefulness with which students will look through YouTube videos. And I think you'll be able to, I think you'll really be shocked um, by how well students can separate the wheat from the chaff when it comes to educational videos on YouTube. Okay, here's the last one. Uh, you don't have time to redefine chemistry teaching right now. Uh, a lot of folks, when they start playing around with these, you know, creative things like making videos, making PowerPoints, they have so many great ideas. And they're like, oh man, I, I, I want to make the most perfect lesson on kinetics. And oh, we should really teach equilibrium this way. That's awesome. And in the future, you'll have plenty of time to do that, to write that absolutely beautiful, perfect book, to make a beautiful series of 200 videos. But for right now, just focus on getting your students for the rest of the semester. Learn everything you can, keep all your great ideas in a little notebook. But at the end of the day, just remember that right now, you don't have time to totally redefine how we teach chemistry. Save that for the future, help your students for right now. So those are some of my tips and tricks uh, summarized on the last slide. Those are some of my tips and tricks on uh, some things to keep in your mind when you start diving into educational videos for the first time.